Hey YouTube, my name is Rob and I make videos about machine learning and data science. Right next to me, I have a chessboard set up. The reason why I have that is because today we are gonna be training our very own object detection model to detect the different pieces on a chessboard. Now in this video, you're gonna learn a ton of stuff. We're gonna show you YOLO V5 and YOLO V7, how to set up data for training a custom object detector. We're actually gonna train the model and evaluate how it's performing as it trains. We're gonna get into the details of the evaluation metrics for object detection and why that's so important and then we're going to show you how well our object detection performs on this chessboard okay let's get into it so what even is yolo we're not talking about you only live once here we're talking about yolo the algorithm basically there was a paper written in 2015 which blew out of the water every other object detection algorithm at the time and since then there have been a bunch of different implementations version 1 all the way now to version 7 it's important to note that while there are different versions of YOLO, the implementations may be made by different open source contributors. These plots show on the same data set how well they perform and also the speed in which they're able to predict. Most implementations are in PyTorch, but you can also find TensorFlow versions. I actually have already done a lot of the setup for YOLO v5 and YOLO v7. I made sure that I clone each of the repos, I have a YOLO v5 directory, and I have a YOLO v7 directory. Also, I am running Linux on my computer. This should still work on different platforms, but it's important if you wanna run on a GPU that that you have CUDA installed. So I'm just gonna load up NVTOP, which lets us see the processes that are running on the GPUs on my machine. And you'll be able to see that when we run inference and training that these GPUs are gonna get some use. So let's start out by going to YOLO v5. Each of these models has different weights that you can choose from. This is where I've downloaded some weights in my YOLO v5 directory. So you can see YOLO v5s is the smallest version. It's only 15 megabytes. X6 is 270 megabytes. The size of the model is going to make inference time slower, but it is going to be generally a more accurate model. Now, the other thing I've done already is I've created Conda environments. So if I Conda activate, YOLO v5. This is now my Conda environment where I've installed everything in the requirements.txt file. So I just did pip install dash r for this requirements.txt and that installed everything that YOLO v5 needed to run. So now that I have that Conda environment activated, I'm gonna use Python detect. Let's give it the YOLO v5 x6 these are the largest weights for YOLO v5. I do have a few different cameras here, so this command will tell me what my device numbers are for my different webcams. Okay, I had to turn off my camera in the corner there to get this working, but now you can see on this device that I am running YOLO v5 x6, and you can see it's not perfect, but it does detect things like it's detecting the chair, it thinks this microphone is a cell phone, it can't detect the chess pieces. That's because it's, that's not pre-trained classes that it's trying to look for. It sees the plots. And I'm actually really impressed by the books that it can tell up here on my bookshelf. And of course the potted plant, oh, wrong side. You can also see the confidence boxes here that are in the corner from this run. If we had set the threshold a little bit higher, some of these false positives would not come up. So I'm gonna run it again with a confidence threshold of 0.9. All right, now you can see it's only showing the, the objects that it's confident in. I also wanna show you that it's trained on these 80 classes, which include things like cups and even bananas. And if we wanna see these results, we actually now can look in a runs directory that was created and it actually has two folders, one for training and one for detections. We wanna see our detection. And if I show all of these, I've actually run a bunch of experiments, but it creates a new folder for each experiment. The last one that we just ran was 132. And if I do xdg open, I'll open this in Linux. And you can see that there's an MP4 file here. This MP4 file has the video of what I recorded before. All right, now let's go into the YOLO v7 repo. I'm gonna conda deactivate 
my YOLO V5 Conda environment and Conda activate my YOLO V7. So actually, I think that most of the format of this repo is very similar to YOLO V5. So I think I could just run this again. Okay, so here I'm recording the output of YOLO V7. It looks like the output video is a little bit more stuttery. I'm not sure if that's because it's actually running at a higher frame rate, um, but you can see that the predictions are pretty good, that it's detecting me as a person, the plan in the books, just like YOLO V5. And uh, here's a banana just to check. Here's a cup, kind of brown banana, pretty good. Again, if I go into runs, and detect and we look at this last experiment for YOLO v7. This is the video from YOLO v7 and here's the video from YOLO v5. So my takeaway from this so far is that it looks like it might be something with the implementation of YOLO v7 but it's having some issues with the webcam frame rate now I'm not sure if that's true when you run it on a video file because it would be running on every single frame in the video. But um, because of that, I'm actually gonna train our model using YOLO V5 for this experiment. One thing I've learned is that the implementation looks really similar between YOLO V5 and YOLO V7. So everything we learn here should be fairly similar to how we would run it on either or. Let's get to that chessboard. Now, when you're running the default YOLO model weight, it's only gonna detect 80 classes. If we go into this data directory and look up the Coco YAML file, it actually will show us all of these different classes that we could predict. So these are all the names of the classes. And if you say wanted to run a prediction only on people or only on bicycles, you would give it the associated index number in this list. So zero would be a person predicting only, one would be a bicycle. We wanna train our model to work on custom data on our chessboard back there. And normally what that would mean is you'd have to gather and label your own data set. But lucky for us, there already exists a data set that we can use just as an example to see how well our chessboard model will run. And I'm downloading this from a website called RoboFlow. They have a handful of data sets and this one is a data set with chessboard and all of the pieces labeled. So you see we can download in different data formats where it already has this, it set up for for us and I've done just that just to show you clicked on YOLO v5 PyTorch and you can download a zip version to your computer for YOLO v7 you would just pick this so I've downloaded and unzipped that into my YOLO v5 directory in the folder named chess and you could see in this folder there is a training folder a validation folder and a test folder there's also this data yaml file which will be important for what we're doing so let's first look at the data yaml this has the location of our training images our validation images and it also has the number of classes as nc and the names of the classes that we want so we have 13 different classes for each of the pieces on the chessboard. Now, if we look in the training directory, there's actually two different folders. So I'm gonna open this here so we can see it. In the images folder, we actually have all the different images from this data set. It looks like a chessboard from the same angle. And then in the labels folder, we have files that have the similar naming convention as the images. These files contain the bounding boxes of each of the pieces in the image that we saw before. So the first value is the class that we remember we had set up in the data YAML file. And then these are the positions on the image where they occur. Now, if you wanted to label your own data set, you can do that. There are some software out there that will let you select the different objects that you want to label. It does take time. So it's nice that we have a pre-existing data set and we don't have to go through that process in this tutorial. So in order to train this model, we're gonna run a Python train file 
And let's just run help to see what our options are when we're training this data set. So the main things we wanna look at here are the weights parameter, where we'll pass in the pre-trained weights for the YOLO model where we will start our training from. That allows us to leverage transfer learning, all the stuff that the model has learned when trained on those 80 classes can be adapted into learning our new classes. It's usually best to start with pre-trained weights. The next big thing is this data, and that's gonna be linked to where our data set YAML file is that contains all the classes, the number of classes, and then the directories of our train and our validation set. We can change our batch size to make sure that it fits into the memory of our GPUs, and we can also set the number of epochs that we want the model to train for. But I'm gonna keep it pretty simple here. We're gonna start with the YOLO V5 X weights. The data is gonna be this chess data YAML file. We will have to go into this data YAML file and I'm going to, I am actually gonna copy in the directory where these images are saved on my local machine so that YOLO can find those when I'm training. Also gonna tell it which device to train on and then I'm gonna give it a batch size of 16 to start out with. Now, if right below this, I load up NVTOP while this is running. The NVIDIA number one GPU here is being loaded up and you can see it's actually being used to train. And it says it's out of memory. All right, so that batch size must be too large because it's filling up my full D GPU. So I'm gonna change the batch size to a little bit smaller, batch size of eight. There we go, now it's actually training. And by default, it's gonna train for 300 epochs. This is epoch zero of the 300 and we can see the progress as it's going on and some metrics. You'll see P is for precision and recall and MAP is our main score that is used for accuracy of object detection. While that model's training, I'm gonna briefly try to explain how this MAP metric works. It really gets at the heart of object detection and some of the things you might wanna consider when you're determining what makes a good object detection model for you. So in any case where we're trying to predict objects in an image, we can have any of these four cases. A true positive is you correctly identify the correct object. A false positive is you've incorrectly detected that object. So maybe detecting a queen when it's actually a pawn. A false negative means that the model missed detecting an object that was in the image. Then we also need to understand intersection over union. So this has to do with how well do our prediction boxes actually line up with the ground truth boxes. The calculation is pretty simple. So if you have the ground truth bounding box and you have our predicted bounding box, which is in red, the intersection over union is calculated as the area of the overlap divided by the combined area of both boxes. And you can see that for a perfect prediction, this would be one, and if these boxes did not overlap very much at all, this number could be very small. So now we can see how this can be a little bit complicated when we have both IOU that we need to consider and the precision and recall of our model. So depending on which IOU threshold we pick, our precision and recall will be different. And we need to determine a threshold that we think is good enough to consider a prediction as a true positive or as a false positive. Now there's also another threshold we need to consider. There's a confidence that's associated with each prediction. So to calculate the average precision part of this metric, we actually vary the thresholds in which those predictions are evaluated. And then we calculate the true positives false positives and create an average precision across all of the classes in that data set. This can seem very confusing, but it is important. The main thing you need to consider is when a model has high recall but low precision, the mo model classifies most of the positive samples correctly, but it has many false positives. And when it has high precision but low recall, then the model is accurate when it classifies a sample as positive, but it may classify only some of the positive examples and miss out on some. So then MAP is calculated as the weighted mean of precisions at each different thresholds. Now the other thing is you can run TensorBoard on this. So we're within the experiment folder that we're currently running and I'm running TensorBoard 
just by typing in TensorBoard with the log directory being that current directory. And we can see now if we load up a browser window to port 6006, we can actually see these metrics as it's training. So we want the map to be increasing to show that it's actually improving. You might have some epochs where things get slightly worse and then improve. So you wanna let it train for long enough where you can see uh, this map increasing and the losses continuing to decrease. I find this really helpful, especially if you're comparing runs versus each other to see which one was better, TensorBoard can be very helpful. There's also integration with weights and biases, which is a similar logging platform like this that's held in the cloud. I've stopped the training now because it looks like most of these metrics have leveled off here and the model really isn't improving that much the more we train. This always will be the case, especially if you have a learning rate that decays over time where the model will just kind of reach an optimum and you could train for years and it's not gonna get any better. So let's take this what model that we've trained now and run some detection. So we can run it the same way we did before by doing Python detect. And now we're actually gonna provide it weights that are in this runs directory. So runs, our experiment number is 13. And then remember we have this weights directory and we're gonna pull the best weights from that. And we're gonna give it the source of five, which is this camera over here. There we go, we can see that it's not perfect, but it is detecting our pieces. So we have, if I hold up to the camera, it does know this is a black rook. Now I wanna go back to the data set we trained on so we can get an idea of maybe why the model isn't as impressive as we would hope. Now if we see here in our training examples, we have a standard angle where the chessboard is set up. If I try to set up our chessboard in a similar angle to what we see here, is a little bit more accurate. Not perfect, but a little bit more accurate. Now let's try to clear it out so we have a little bit less pieces here. Okay, so I've set up the board here now in a famous end game. If you know what game this setup is from, let me know in the comments below. We could see here it's still not perfect. It's calling this bishop a rook. The pawns it seems to be doing better with. And because this pawn is obscured, we can't see it as well. That it's doing a good job of actually detecting each piece. If I hold up a piece, you can see that it's getting this black knight correctly. So that brings us on to maybe some ways we would want to improve this model. The data set that we did train on, as I mentioned, is a very controlled environment. We have the same angle, the same lighting, and the same pieces and boards. The more we can augment this by having different angles and having different board types, the model will be able to generalize better. And this is pretty much true for all of machine learning. The model is not going to generalize well unless it's given a diverse set of training examples.